evolutionary computing has shown great potential in the field of optimization. Agent-based modeling involves the use of psychologically designed individuals, or groups thereof, to simulate and study the effects of human collaboration. This is a robot too, like This is kind of cool. You blow at it and it walks. You see? It's, it's actually wind, a wind-powered robot. You've got to blow quite high there. Dr. Peter Bentley, honorary professor in the Computer Science Department at University College London, is also author and editor of numerous books, including Creative Evolutionary Systems. Um, how do genes relate to phenotypes, I suppose you could ask? Um, you know, it's really problem dependent. Um, so the, um, let's say in the beginning, when we first started using evolution to solve problems in computers, we regarded evolution as something of an optimizer. Uh, it, it's a, let's say it's quite an approximation of, of perhaps what evolution really does, but you can think of the genes in organisms as being improved, if you like, changed, optimized over time to enable living creatures to, to have correspondingly useful phenotypic features. In other words, traits. It's, it's useful if a, if a cheetah can run faster if it's trying to catch its prey, and the genes that are responsible for those change over time and hopefully make it run faster. So this inspired uh, computer scientists to think, well, what if we have some kind of problem? Perhaps we're trying to optimize the shape of an aircraft wing or uh, uh, the shape of a, a blade of a propeller, for example. Um, so what we used to do is we would parameterize different aspects of that design. Um, maybe if it's a wing, we'd parameterize its length, its width, sort of certain aspects of its curvature, maybe its kind of shape in various aspects. And then each of those parameters, we codify as a gene. Um, and then the genes for every candidate solution, every possible solution, every possible wing shape, um, these form like an organism, like a little virtual organism that are all tested. So you have a population of these and each one is mapped to a wing shape. How well does it fly? Not so good, very good. The fitter ones, the ones that maybe enable it to fly a bit better, um, they actually give them more kids. And when a couple of these quite fit individuals generate children, well, we apply a crossover operator. So these codified parameters, these genes are crossed over, usually at a binary level. So we'll mix up the binary ones and noughts that make up those values to create new genes, new values for the offspring. And then we've got a new population of offspring, which we test. How well do they fly? Some not so good, some good. And the best ones of those have children. And those are mixed up. Bit of crossover, bit of mutation now and again. So once in a while, we'll actually mutate these genes so we see something a little bit different. And over time, over many generations, evolution actually happens. You get evolution within a computer. Um, and in the case of this example, you might get better and better aircraft wing shapes, more and more efficient, for example. Dr. Peter Bentley is also Chief Technology Officer at AI company Braintree Limited. Braintree is an AI company. It's a, it's a research and development AI company. Um, so we have a research lab where we investigate um, some fundamental theories and some we try to generate new algorithms. Um, this includes work on modeling spiking neural networks. Um, so we're trying to understand how the brain works better. We've got researchers looking at how cancers change over time. And so we're looking at agent-based models going down to the cellular or genetic level. Um, because tumors develop, tumors evolve and change over time. And if you apply therapies to kind of counteract the growth of a cancer at the wrong time, it'll have a detrimental effect um, uh, to the outcome that you're looking for. Um, so uh, it's important to really understand the nature of an individual tumour with an individual patient. So we're trying to help step towards tailored cancer treatments with, with that work. 
we're looking at um, ensembles of neural networks for autopilot systems. So we've got um, an intelligent autopilot system that can fl fly aircraft more effectively than human pilots can, even when that aircraft is undergoing significant damage. So we can literally knock out the engines or have horrible weather conditions that a human pilot cannot cope with, and this intelligent autopilot will be able to do an emergency landing and do all the necessary procedures or keep the plane flying as though nothing's happened. Um, we're looking at new combinations of techniques. So can we create graph native machine learning algorithms, machine learning that's designed to work with graph structured data? Or can we combine reinforcement learning with multiple, uh, with multi-agent techniques? Uh, as called MAL, multi-agent reinforcement learning. Can we have multi-agent models automatically fine-tune themselves? So those are some of the things we've got going on in our research lab. Um, I'm still a professor at University College London, so uh, all of my team are based here, as well as uh, those that Braintree sponsor. Uh, we also have a consultancy department and we uh, do consultancy for large organisations who, who basically want us to do machine learning and, and data analytics for their various problems. And we have some of the world's largest uh, retailers and uh, manufacturers that we help with their various issues. And finally, we're looking at product development. Um, of which we have several things that we're working on, but perhaps I won't go into those at this point. <laughs> so we're, we're all going to be going to um, uh, talk in Tokyo, and um, th that's why you're seeing posters and things. Did you see Pete's? It was quite good. Uh, no, not yet. Oh, he's got it upstairs. He did it on fabric. It's quite a nice looking poster. And uh, you haven't got a poster, have you? Uh, I do from the museum. From the museum. Other one, yeah. It's yeah. on fabric. Yes. Oh, it is on fabric yeah. too. I, I never I saw it. Oh, uh, really? Oh, wow. Well, so sometimes useful traits are lost during evolution, and sometimes you've got to live with that. So um, it, it's a it's a, a randomized search process. It's not random, but it has a random element to it. Um, the course of evolution is generally improvement, but sometimes good things are lost, sometimes they're not lost. Well, there are certain tricks that we put in place, and often these tricks are inspired from natural evolution. Um, and these might be to give, um, well, there's, there's a number of <laughs> things we use. I don't know how many, technically, uh, how many examples of these you actually want, but th there's a number that we use. Um, some can be that we um, allow some of these individuals to live a bit longer. So we might allow them to survive longer than others in a population. And of course, if you survive beyond a single generation, you get to have a few more kids. Um, however, if you do that too much, you might end up with um, some excessively successful individuals who go on to dominate the gene pool with all of their kids. Um, and maybe that doesn't sound like a bad idea if you're really good, but actually often problems are quite noisy. And so sometimes you get a lucky individual who just because of a particular example, maybe a particular wing shape happened to fly through a pocket of air that was perfect for it at one instance in time, and that made it super fit. And then we decided, oh, we're just gonna let him have all the kids he wants because he's super fit. And then the entire population is now dominated by this guy's kids, except that that little pocket of air never existed again. So everyone is actually pretty useless at flying. So what we tend to do to avoid that is we give them a lifespan. And again, you know, it seems like an obvious thing to, to have. This is what natural evolution has been. We have to build these things into our algorithms. Otherwise we end up with immortal individuals. So the simple, uh, method of allowing the fitter ones to be around a bit longer, but not too long, so that um, any, any lucky individual, well, okay, he doesn't last forever, or she doesn't last forever, um, and therefore other individuals get a chance to have their go. So that, that's one of the basic tricks. There are many other ways that we also use um, to try and maintain 
good and successful individuals with an evolving population. Um, I think bloats are an artifact of a bad representation. So uh, le let me answer that in a, in a broader sense. So um, one of the things we learn, and I, I'm, I'm one of these computer scientists who, who work a lot with biologists to try and understand how this, this kind of thing really happens in nature. One of the things we learn is that um, DNA is a remarkably evolvable structure. And what does that mean? It, it means that over the billions of years that it has been used to help creatures, help define creatures, help, help us come into being, um, it's had to build into itself various methods, various structures, various strategies for maintaining its own integrity um, and enabling itself to actually to change quite rapidly. So there are some periods in a species um, history where it's good if DNA just protects itself. It doesn't want to be damaged. It's got a good solution. Look at sharks. Sharks are in a pretty sta static environment. If you're a shark, it's a pretty good solution. You want to protect that design. And so there's a lot of mechanisms in, in all organisms' DNA that protects its error correction. Don't let it get messed up. But then there are other parts of DNA where it's really useful if you can evolve it quite quickly. And so it's, it's in organisms, in, in the species' best interest, to be able to um, evolve rapidly should an environment change rapidly. Now, one extreme example of that is actually in our immune systems. So one of the biggest um, and rapid, most rapidly changing environments is actually the environment of bacteria and viruses around us. And so within us, within every one of our DNA, there's a little region which actually mutates and changes within our lifetimes. So we actually have a, a, a kind of microevolution that happens within our bodies. And this is in our B cells that, that generate antibodies. That the region of our DNA that generates a wide diversity of antibodies is mutating rapidly. And it has to do that because it has to create antibodies that will fit the shapes of new uh, invading parasites or viruses, whatever they might be, invading pathogens that have never existed before. So the only way, and they evolve so quickly, you know, these viruses, bacteria, they, they you know, we, we reproduce every 20 years, perhaps. Um, a virus every, every few minutes, sometimes every few seconds. They evolve fast. That's why we always catch a cold. We, we, we get immune to each one in, in turn, but they, they rearrange themselves and they look a bit different. So our immune system evolves rapidly to, to counter that. So what does all this mean? This means that um, DNA is a remarkable structure. It's, it's both able to protect itself from evolution and exploit evolution where it needs to. And all of these tricks um, embodied within the design of this highly complex molecule, um, well, they're actually really tough for us to get to the bottom of. Basically, we're, we're trying to work on the cutting edge of um, AI, I suppose it's called these days. Um, I've, I've been in this game long enough that AI was not a fashionable word. You know, AI comes and goes and... Um, you're, you're one of the few that understands that my background is evolutionary computing, but most people these days have forgotten that. <laughs> and I work in, in many different areas. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot of potential. And, and actually what, what people forget most is, um, I think they, what they forget most is all the, the value that can be had from working with biologists and other disciplines. The, there's so much knowledge and there's so much um, so many interesting solutions that biology has because it's had so long to invent different things um, that actually if you like harvesting the natural world maybe that sounds nasty being inspired by the natural world is is a is a very fruitful thing and and also actually every time we think we've invented something cool we we have a deeper look in in biology and we find that 
oh, it's been there for millions of years already in, in some form in biology. So all these ideas that we've got in, in computer programming of subroutines and loops and conditional statements, they're all in our DNA. They've, they, you know, as we develop as an organism, they've been there forever. Uh, well, not forever, but for a long time. Look, there are lots of different ways in which we can encode a, a bunch of parameters as a, as a genome in our algorithms. The, the simplest is just, you've got a parameter, you turn it into a binary number and you mess with the binary digits and that's your gene. A more complex method is, let's say you want to evolve something that looks like a tree, something like a, a computer program or a, or a function, and that has this multiple branches going on and if then or a loop or you know the, this is more it looks a bit more like a tree basically so one could say oh why don't we represent that as like a tree structure and that's what we do in a a, a type of genetic algorithm called genetic programming however the problem with some of these representations and, and gp is one of them is that when you allow these tree-like structures to reproduce so two parents come together and you do crossover and you mutate them rather bizarrely over time you end up with redundant dna you end up with redundant structures um, as you might imagine for example an if then statement could be if if one equals one then do a otherwise do b well you're never going to do b are you because one always equals one so it's a redundant bit, but actually there are many other examples of redundant parts of a solution that, that can uh, be generated. And you can see some of this happening in biological organisms. There, there is what used to be called junk DNA. We don't really call it junk DNA anymore because we now recognise it actually does rather a lot of useful things. Some of it nevertheless in, in biological organisms is... is um, it's a remnants of a past that um, maybe we don't want to keep. There, there are uh, some retroviruses, such as HIV, um, that actually, they're called retroviruses because they actually insert a bit of their own DNA into your DNA, and, and that's how they reproduce. But that can actually be passed on and so there are, if you like, fossils of old viruses still sitting within our DNA. Not so useful, although evolution is very good at making use of all these bits and pieces. In, in our uh, genetic programming algorithms, yeah, it's not so useful, and, and often it gets in the way. Um, so with our, our evolutionary algorithms are, are much simpler, and all those tricks to do with protecting DNA or making things more evolvable, very rarely used, actually. But they, there's, a, there's a thousand tricks that happen in natural evolution that we just probably don't even know about and that we've not yet put into our algorithms. Um, did it? Um, <laughs> how did the onset of the Internet of Things... Do, do you mean in, in, in general or Internet of Things? Yeah, of uh, evolutionary computing. Um, um, I, I actually wish it affected it more. Um, and, and maybe there's still a time for it to affect it more. The, in, in, a, you know, in a related field such as neural networks, um, something called deep learning, which everybody seems to know about now, um, it's a deep learning is a really good rebranding of neural networks that my old pal Jeff Hinton came up with. Um, so that that was very successful, and the reason why it's very successful is that the internet and let's say cloud-based computing enables uh, a vast amount of data to be accessible and enables a large amount of processing to be accessible. Um, and plus a few good tweaks of the algorithms themselves. And the combination of those things result in um, a very powerful kind of machine learning. So that's, that's deep learning neural networks. Um, 
I, I personally think it would be great if the same thing could happen with evolutionary computing. I, I think right now evolutionary computing is not as fashionable as deep learning, as, as uh, these other machine learning methods. Um, the idea of optimization in general has slightly fallen out of flavor compared to machine learning, even though the two are arguably much the same kind of thing, and you can use one to do the other. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one could argue that the same large amount of data and the same access to a large amount of computing power um, has the potential to transform the field of evolutionary computing as well. And I'd say in other fields too. I'm, I'm a fan of agent-based computing, which is related to evolutionary computing. Um, it's another way of modeling individuals that interact, which is kind of what happens in evolution. Um, I, I would argue, yeah, the, the future may be coming soon that these other algorithms, evolutionary computing and its flavors, um, there's developmental methods, there's artificial immune systems, there's, there's even swarming based algorithms. All of these might benefit in time from this readily available um, large computing resource that we now have. Um, but I have to say fashions come and go and, and we are in a machine learning and AI fashion at the moment. Do you want me to blow this? Yes. I don't know how useful it is. Puff. Sometimes it gets a bit stuck. Yeah, it took one stir there. Okay, you just got to get me red in the face, blowing the things down. <laughs> but they, these guys are fun. This, this guy is a, is a fun little fella. Each, each one of his switches does something. So you can turn off various bits of them. This is all made from reclaimed components. So these are old Dixie tubes back from the uh, 50s and 60s. And um, the artist was inspired by individual components. So he would take a particular component like, like this little switch here and he would imagine a robot around it. Um, so, and then it, it's, it's got its own little brain inside with its little electronics. I mean, this is not something I can program, I'm afraid. This is, all this guy can do is tell the time in his own unique way. But um, somehow he's a charming little fella, I think. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, so one, one thing we've been looking at recently is agent-based modeling of people. Um, if you can, in an evolutionary algorithm, if you can model, uh, let's say, organisms in terms of their genetic structure and, and evolve their genes over time, why can't you do that in terms of um, understanding how people interact? So what if you have a population of people that um, have to collaborate to solve some kind of problem? Um, well, most existing models, and there are existing models, that they're used throughout um, e economics and um, uh, related fields. Uh, they try and model how we might behave in different circumstances to try and understand maybe how to negotiate or how to set up businesses or how to run the economy even. Um, but all of these existing models, they kind of assume, um, number one, that the idea of cooperation is almost something that arises uh, in, a, in a surprising way, that we've all got our own selfish needs and somehow it's a surprise that we end up cooperating, which I, I think is not quite right. This, this guy is, uh, as I said, I'm not sure I've got the batteries for this guy, but he's quite entertaining when he's on. And these guys run around and stuff. Um, I really, yeah, it'd be good if I had batteries because he's quite fun. And Plio over there is um, a, a cool robot, but he also doesn't have any charged up batteries. Number two, they assume um, that all agents are rational. Um, and that patently isn't the case. Um, unfortunately, when you look at any organisation, whether it's uh, a class of people trying to learn together, or whether it's a company, a team trying to work together, 
Number one, actually, particularly let's say you're a company and you've got a team trying to build a product, well, it's not a coincidence that they're cooperating. They're, they're, they're cooperating by design. They, they are collaborating. Okay, and I think this is a key difference, but not, not enough people actually model collaboration. People working together for a common goal. This, this is quite different from cooperating accidentally. You know, a, a criminal might choose to cooperate with the police, but their aims in life are rather different. But police collaborate with each other because their aims are the same. So number one, Cooperation is actually a very fundamental part of human society, and it's important that we model it. Number two, this assumption of rational behaviour. Well, if only that were the case, because then there would never be any problems in life, would there? <laughs> but unfortunately, as I'm sure we're all aware, if, if you working in a group of people, even if you are all trying to do the same thing, you are all co cooperating to meet this common goal, there are personality clashes. There, there are people who want, they think their idea is more important somehow. There are people who have a, a louder voice than others or a quieter voice than others. There are people who get very nervous about new things. Or there are people who love to explore different ideas. There are people who are very good at detail work and people who are hopeless at detail work and good at the big picture. So the question is then, well, given all these different kinds of brains that we've got, um, who should be working together to be a most effective team? Which, which combinations of personalities are optimal to solve any given task? And whilst uh, psychologists are great at profiling individuals, um, nobody really understands how to profile groups of people working together. It, it's long been a, a goal in psychology to do this, don't really know how to do it. Um, but actually, it's something that we can model in a computer. So this is what we've been doing most recently. We've been doing agent-based modeling where we can actually model the way someone thinks. Um, so the way their brain kind of moves around in a problem space. So I'm thinking about this idea, now and I've got a new idea, now I've got another new idea. I'm moving around, I'm trying different ideas. Um, and as I do so in a team, I'm communicating with you and you're having ideas and your brain is moving around in this problem space. So we can model the way we think as, as though it were a strange optimization algorithm. I'm trying to optimize my idea of what the answer is. You're trying to do the same in your brain. We communicate as we do it. And the way I do it is dependent on my traits, my personality traits. The way you do it is dependent on your personality traits. And that way we end up with a population of individuals, each with their own little personality, each collaborating in a funny way. Um, and we can model that on a computer and you end up with an ensemble of optimization algorithms all trying to solve the problem together. Some of them are very bad at it, <laughs> some are very good at it. And through this way, and through obviously calibrating to real world data and, and uh, with the help of some psychologists as well, we're able to do really quite interesting work on understanding which groups of people should be working together. And of course, this has a lot of implications for recruitment, for managing people, for helping to train people. Um, so uh, we, we think it's a, quite a good thing to do. Um, Braintree is a very fun place to work. And <laughs> we, uh, we actually collaborate very closely with uh, University College London. So um, we uh, do our best to hire all the good talent out of UCL. Um, and we're, we're one of the few companies that can offer quite a, a range of different positions and we allow every member of staff to be involved in research if they want to. So whether it's our office manager to a data scientist to anybody, they, they can co-author a research paper should they choose. I think this is quite cool. I, I take it back. The, the back. I wasn't sure about the back. No, it's, it's good because it's I swap it without the back and it looks more dark without the back. It's actually quite, it's quite yeah. funky though. Right? <laughs> What's the basis of creativity in humans? Um, I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, uh, however, there are many... Um, the, there are many hypotheses about what that might be. And one of them is that 
somehow it resembles an evolutionary process. Um, that somehow ideas are combined and mutated and, and um, almost evolve in the minds of many of us um, over time, like an evolutionary process. Uh, Richard Dawkins was one of the very first to, to kind of talk about the, the, uh, the concept of an idea as a gene, which of course he called a meme. Um, in one of his books, I think it was, the, was it The Extended Phenotype? Or was it uh, The Blind Watchmaker? It was one of those. Anyway, it caught on. The, the meme of a meme is very successful. Um, and so uh, whether it's true or not, well, I don't know. I think it's a way of thinking. However, it's quite possible for us to model creativity using evolutionary processes, because I guess it's close enough. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the problem that we have in computer science is a lot, of, a lot of them are engineers and mathematicians and they forget that they're not as clever as they think, actually, and you can get, you can get a lot of useful things out of, um, um, out of biology and other disciplines, chemistry, physics. Um, I, I've worked with more biologists than I, I remember now. Um, I spent a long time on immunobiology, um, but also developmental biology and genetics, and I've done a bit of neuroscience. Um, so, you know, am I being filmed or photographed? <laughs> <laughs>